Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on designing event-based studies to reduce sample size and increase predictability. My name is Alyssa Biller, and I'm a solutions consultant in the product development group here at Cytel. I will be your host for today. It is now my pleasure to introduce your speaker for today, Pantelis Vlahos. Pantelis is a principal strategic consultant for Cytel based in Geneva. He joined the company in January 2013. Before that, he was a principal biostatistician at Merck Serono, as well as a professor of statistics at Carnegie Mellon University for 12 years. His research interests lie in the area of adaptive designs, mainly from a Bayesian perspective, as well as hierarchical model testing and checking, although his secret passion is text mining. He has served as managing editor of the journal Bayesian Analysis, as well as editorial boards of several other journals and online statistical data and software archives. It is now my pleasure to hand it over to Pantelis. Thank you, Alisa, and thank you all for um, being present uh, in this session. Uh, in the next hour or so, I will try to present some uh, theoretical as well as practical aspects of uh, designing time to event studies, uh, as well as some of the new features that we have added uh, into EAST, our software uh, that allows us uh, for some more benefits um, for the design of such studies. So with that, uh, I will turn on uh, into my presentation, as you can see here. So some of those benefits, uh, as I mentioned, I will try to, to go through uh, in the beginning part of my uh, uh, presentation. Um, although we are not actually going to be seeing uh, adaptive designs in general, our focus is going to be on a special type of these types of designs, which is the group sequential designs, um, where the adaptation that we are envisioning is stopping the study early, either for efficacy uh, or for futility. We will see how to move uh, from fixed designs to group sequential designs, how to try and time uh, the interim analysis of these group sequential designs in a more accurate manner, and how to obtain updated estimates of our probability of success. All of these are going to be based uh, on the concept of uh, conditional simulations, which is one of the capabilities um, uh, of our software. In terms of the benefits or the hidden benefits of uh, adaptive trial designs, those can actually be uh, partitioned into two uh, areas. One is the business case. Uh, there have been different publications that have studied uh, the benefits of adaptive uh, studies, adaptive designs. Um, one of them is the one that I'm quoting currently on this slide, which is by Healy in uh, 2009, where um, they went through 23 group sequential studies, 17 dose finding studies, and a couple of studies with uh, sample size re-estimation. And they did a comparison of uh, adaptive studies with uh, non-adaptive ones. And they showed the benefits, they quantified the benefits in terms of time, in terms of sample size and duration of the study, as well as in terms of cost. Um, there is a more recent paper by Palmar et al., uh, which also mentions the shorter duration and uh, the more precise conclusions. But all of them, of course, come with a price, the price of a more complex study uh, compared to a traditional fixed uh, design. So what we're going to try and do today is we're going to try and alleviate some of the concerns about the, the complexity of these studies with the ease uh, of uh, the help and the help of our software. The second component is the human case, um, where with uh, adaptive designs and group sequential designs as well, we have the potential to expedite uh, patients' ac access to effective therapies. We may be able to stop studies early if they don't exhibit the benefit that we thought they have. We may be able to drop treatment arms. We may be able to reallocate subjects to more promising uh, therapies. So there is an, an ethical component uh, in these uh, studies as well. So what we're going to be seeing is we're going to be focusing, as I mentioned uh, on the title, on time-to-event uh, studies. And for those time-to-event studies, uh, the general approach is going to be pretty much similar as the one with uh, when we have normal or binomial type of endpoints. We are given 
a treatment effect that we're targeting in the alternative hypothesis. We're given a type 1 error, a power, and based on those, we calculate the maximum information. And then we try to um, translate that maximum information either in terms of the sample size, in the case of a normal or a binomial type of endpoint, or translate that in terms of number of events if we have a time to event endpoint. So the information is directly proportional to the number of events, and it is the number of events that drives and determines the power of the study. Of course, we always need to know, the sponsor needs to know, how many subjects will need to be recruited in order to be able to trust the results. So if the study duration is not fixed, there is always a trade-off between sample size and study duration, but we also provide tools within our software to essentially see uh, what the relationship between the accrual and the study duration is and uh, the subjects accrued uh, over time. So there is um, a way that you can actually try and find sort of like the, the golden uh, solution, the best uh, approach uh, in terms of uh, how many subjects would need to be recruited uh, and in one, what period of time they would need to, that need to be done. So with uh, time to event studies, there are a number of challenges, um, challenges that would need to be overcome. And what we will do um, in this um, webinar is to try and present approaches and the accompanying tools that will allow us to efficiently design such studies, to boost our accuracy in predicting the timing of the interim analysis, so have a better confidence on the timelines, whether this is the timing of the interim analysis, which in turn have to do with the setup of data monitoring committees, et cetera, and shorten the expected duration of the studies. We're going to be moving away from a fixed design, and sometimes this is not easy for organizations. Senior leadership and your counterparts as statisticians in other departments will greatly benefit from the improved clarity and the expected course of the trial and see you as a partner in planning trials in the future. So with with what I'm going to try to show you is how to, we can establish this communication path with the senior leadership and our counterparts in the other departments to strengthen this partnership um, that will assist in planning of studies in the future. So our tool, our main tool uh, in all this is going to be the, the flagship software of Cytel, uh, which is EAST. Uh, this has been around for more than uh, 20 years. Uh, it has a broad coverage of designs uh, for biostatisticians. Uh, we have brought in the functionality from different pieces of software that historically dealt with fixed designs, with group sequential and adaptive designs, and packaged it all um, in one um, entity. The interface, uh, for those of you who are used to the old Excel-based interface of EAST has changed. There are multiple windows with graphs and tables. You can organize your work in workbooks. You can have your design nested within your design. You can have your simulations as well as your interim monitoring. And you can rapidly create, view, and filter multiple scenarios at once with just the press of a button by specifying ranges of parameters. Um, we have been in the past, uh, and we still are, a trusted partner for most uh, big pharma companies, as well as the regulators, as we train both um, uh, institutions. And we have, we will try to bring you a commitment to continuously improving and expanding the features um, of our software. Um, this partial is gonna become apparent today by introducing you some uh, new features that we have added into the structure of EAST. Uh, but uh, for those of you uh, who are attending this, um, webinar, you will also get in the end a copy of the slides. And in, in the backup portion of the slides, there's going to be a single slide for each one of the modules that comprise the structure of the software, which give you an idea not only of the features of each one of the modules, but also of what we have added as a new feature uh, in the latest version of East 6.5. So this is the, the current structure of EAST. Uh, as I mentioned, it's modular. And what you see highlighted in blue are the modules that we're gonna be touching on today. So we're gonna be starting on to the left with the base module, which where we start with a fixed um, 
sample size design, move into a group sequential design with some adapt with some um, survival endpoints, time to event endpoints. So we're going to be moving into the survival module, and we are also going to be um, doing some conditional simulations uh, and utilizing uh, the predict module both to update the probability of success of the study as well as update our prediction for the enrollment and the events of the study. So we're all going to be basing this in, into a, a case study. So what's going to be following in the next uh, hour or so is I'm going to go actually into demonstration mode of our software. So I will bring up the software, um, but you will also have in the end, these slides as a backup where I will have uh, screenshots and the step-by-step -step instructions of what I covered into the demonstration uh, version. So the uh, the setup that we're envisioning is a case in no small cell lung cancer where the primary endpoint uh, is overall survival. We're going to be designing the study with a one-sided 0.025 type 1 error aiming for 90% power, and we're going to be starting with a fixed design, and then we're going to be expanding to a group sequential design by adding an interim analysis. The control arm median uh, survival is five months versus seven months for the experimental treatment, which yields a hazard ratio of uh, 0.714. And as you will see, we will in order to achieve 90% power, we will roughly need to get to about 370 five events corresponding to enrolling in 24 months about 460 subjects with six more months uh, of follow-up. Uh, there is one more assumption here that there's going to be a dropout uh, rate of about 4% um, per year uh, in this particular study. So this is a time where I'm going to be switching to uh, the interface of our software. Many of you may already be familiar with it. Um, the software by default will open up in the design tab since this is the strength uh, of EAST, but there are other tabs as well which I'm going to be utilizing also today. There's the home tab which allows you to import data into the software. These data can be manipulated in the good sense with a data editor and they can also be analyzed with the analysis tab. So there are analysis capabilities in EAST which we're also going to be uh, exploring today. But of course the strength of the software lies in its design. Um, another thing that I would like to highlight is that in the home tab there is also a link to the PDF version of the manual which is a more than a 3,500 page document which will serve not just uh, as a step-by-step -step instruction of how to do different things in EAST, but it's also a very good reference uh, for the theoretical methods that are behind um, the features uh, of the software. So let's go to the design tab now uh, and we're going to try and enter the information that I mentioned in um, the previous screen. We're going to be selecting a design for time to event endpoints. Um, we're going to have fixed uh, accrual and study duration. Remember, we plan to enroll for 24 months and follow up for six more months. And that, therefore, we select uh, this option from uh, the menu. So the alpha is 0.025 on sided. We're aiming for 90% power. And the survival information can be entered in three different ways, either in terms of hazard rates, of cumulative percent survival, or what we're going to be doing here, which is in terms of median uh, survival time. So as I mentioned, we have five months for the control arm and seven months for the treatment arm. And as you can see, by default, this will automatically update what the hazard ratio is. There's, there's of course, an option to just enter the control, median OS, and then specify the hazard ratio that you're targeting. Uh, and that way, um, will yield essentially the same results. One thing that I wanted to mention here is that you can also explore multiple values um, of uh, either survival times and the control and the treatment by either comma separating or by specifying ranges of parameters in any cell that has a pink color uh, within EAST. Then uh, we move into the last uh, few pieces. As I mentioned, we have uh, 
an accrual that happens over 24 months, and we have an additional six months of follow-up for a total study duration of 30 months. I'm also going to be adding uh, a dropout piece uh, where we said that we can specify the probability of dropout per year at about uh, 4%, and this is entered again uh, in this fashion. So this is the basic information that we would need in order to have um, a fixed sample size design and in order to get 90% power for a hazard ratio of 0.714 you will see that we will need about 372 subjects uh, events and that would mean that 457 subjects would need to be accumulated um, in the 24 months. So this design appears in a temporary view, which is called the Output Preview, which I'm going to be saving into my workbook, and I'm going to be able to um, rename as the fixed samples design so that we can refer to it by that instead of the generic name Design 1, etc. Um, at the same time, one of the things that we may want to explore is to convert this type of design from a fixed to a group sequential. As soon as we change the number of looks from one to anything different than one, say for example two, we have a new tab popping up which is the boundary tab which allows us to specify ways to stop the study for efficacy or for futility. There are different spending functions that we allow. By default it will use the Lana Demetz version of O'Brien and Fleming's spending functions. It can use threshold based methods or an exact version of the O'Brien and Fleming or the POCO boundaries through the more general Wang and Siadis approach. But for the moment, uh, and just to for a variety, we're going to be using uh, an efficacy spending function uh, from the gamma family with a parameter of minus 5. As soon as I've done that, and having set to take the first interim look halfway through the study, you will see that the boundaries are calculated, and these boundaries can also be visualized um, as you can see here, they can be visualized in different scales. By default, the scale is the Z statistic. And you can see here that um, at the very first interim look, we're going to be able to stop the study and declare efficacy early on at the first look if the Z statistic is less than minus 2.9, roughly. This is something that can be also visualized in different other scales. And typically, in a, such a in the time to event study, the most popular scale is to look at it at the hazard ratio scale. Remember, we were aiming for a hazard ratio of 0.714 in the alternative hypothesis. So what this tells us here is with this spending function that we have chosen, if we end up with a hazard ratio below 0.65 at the first interim look, then that would give us a good enough reason to stop the study for efficacy. And again, as you can see, there are different other ways, and different other scales that you can visualize uh, the stopping criteria. For the moment, I'm not going to enter any futility uh, stopping boundary here. Let's just continue with an efficacy stopping boundary. And I'm going to compute this design just to see how many subjects and how many events we're going to be needing for a group sequential design. So I'm going to save this as well into my workbook and I'm going to be named this as the group sequential design. These two designs, although they are different in nature, they can be compared side by side in a look that may rem remind some of you of the old um, East uh, Excel-based format. And as you can see, with the fixed design, we need require 372 events, 457 subjects, with the group sequential design, we're about the same number of events, maximum events, and sample size. But if the drug works, so under the alternative hypothesis, we would appear to have savings in terms of both the number of events and the corresponding sample size. In that case, also, we will also have savings in the duration of the study of roughly about four months, three and a half months. So this is the, the group sequential design and how you can actually compare uh, the two. If I look in a little bit more details on this design, so if I just double click uh, the group sequential design, we will end up seeing a breakdown by arms in terms of the 
maximum expected values and the dropouts for the sample size, number of events, um, and, and the dropouts in terms of the duration. And also see that um, this design will enroll 458 subjects and um, corresponding to 373 events. But the first interim look will take place after 187 uh, events have been uh, obtained. Um, at this point, one of the things that we can do is we can visualize how the number of events and the sample size evolve over time. This visualization, however, assumes that the enrollment of the subjects is constant for the 24 months and the six more months of follow-up. And this is apparent from the straight line that you see up here in terms of the sample size. The, the maroon line here represents the sample size. The green line represents the total number of events. So if I were interested, for example, at how many events I would have, just for an example, at 15 months, I could type in 15 here in the time, and I will see that uh, at 15 months, I would have 286 subjects, 150 events. But I can also do the reverse calculation, click on the sample size and events, and say, well, I know that my first interim needs to take place after 187 events. When will that happen? So with 187 events, you can see that we will require, under the assumption that the enrollment happens in a constant fashion over 24 months, this will happen in about 17.3 months. Okay. So this is, um, again, I have to stress it, this is under the assumption that we have a constant enrollment. Of course, there are ways in EAST where you can specify that the enrollment is not going to be constant. If I go back to my uh, input screen for the accruals and dropouts, you may be able, for example, to set different accrual periods. For example, you can set four different accrual periods. Like you might have about 15% of the subjects accrued within the first six months. Maybe within the year, you would have 30% of the subjects within 18 months, you might have about 65% of the subjects and the remaining in two years. So there is one way to not assume a constant accrual, but maybe assume a piecewise accrual. But there is also a way within East to incorporate information that you might have from an enrollment plan, something that your um, feasibility team or your operations team may provide to you. And the way to do that is by highlighting, again, the design that you have and selecting the option to simulate the design. So what I can do here is I can click on the S button to simulate the design. And what you will see is another input screen, which has the design exactly as we created it. 373 subjects uh, to detect a hazard ratio of 0.714, 458 maximum, uh, sorry, uh, 458 subjects, 373 number of events, and with the accrual and duration and the dropout patterns that we envisioned. At this point, if I make no changes in this input sheet and I just click on the simulate button, then this will simulate a design under the alternative hypothesis, under a hazard ratio of 0.714, and it will count in how many cases out of those 10,000 simulations that I run here, in how many cases I will gonna end up rejecting the null hypothesis. So that's exactly what it's doing here. And essentially what we're calculating is a Monte Carlo way of calculating the probability that you reject the null hypothesis if the alternative is true, which is the Monte Carlo estimate of the power. Remember we had designed this for 90% power, and this is exactly what happens here. Out of the 10,000 replications that we ended up running, we ended up rejecting the null hypothesis 8,954 times for roughly 90% power. And this is without making, of course, any changes, just to validate and verify that, indeed, this is consistent with the way that we designed the study. So any simulation that you create, you can actually save it also into your workbook, and it will be nested under your original um, design. 
But what I'm going to be doing here, the wrinkle that I'm going to be adding, is I'm going to be including an option in my uh, simulation sheet. And for the moment, the option that I'm going to be including is to add, to add site information. So we will have information from an enrollment plan. And this information uh, can either be entered manually, which could be a tedious process, especially if you have different regions and different numbers of sites, or it could be entered by specifying an enrollment plan that you first need to import into the software. So what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be going in the Home tab, selecting to import um, an enrollment plan, and then I'm going to import my enrollment plan for this particular case, which is a file that is comma separated, and as you can see, it appears here. So we are talking about a trial that will take place in about 14 countries, different numbers of sites per countries, and what we have, the basic information that we need for this enrollment plan is when we are exp the earliest and the latest, the sites can be initialized in this uh, per country, the anticipated enrollment rate, and also the enrollment cap per country. So if I go back to my input screen, I can specify this enrollment plan, and I can point now to the file that I just imported into my software. All I have to do is match the, these six terms that I need, the basic information that I need to have, which is the region, which in my case is countries, number of sites in this country, the earliest and the latest a site can open per country, the anticipated enrollment rate, and the enrollment cap. Once I do this, you will see that I will have a very quick snapshot of the enrollment plan that I saw before, reflected into the accrual and dro dropouts tab of my simulation sheet. The, there, for the moment, in East, there are two types of accruals that we can envision. Subjects can either come in uniformly or come in, can come in based on a Poisson distribution. So let's assume the Poisson enrollment for the moment, and let's run again the simulations like we did before, but only now we're also taking into account uh, the site information um, that we uh, have imported. And as you can see, the, the only difference that we saw from the previous simulation run is that at the conclusion of the simulations, there is going to be some housekeeping done into the software because the software will need to collate and store all the simulations that were run. You have an, an opportunity to save um, subject uh, to save summary statistics for the simulations, but you also you can save subject level uh, and site level data, which you can export into your uh, favorite analysis software. So this is exactly what it's doing right now. After it has completed the 10,000 replications, it is. Uh, saving, collating, and saving these simulation results. And as soon as this is done, we would get um, the close uh, button, which just happened. So this information can also be saved into our workbook. And you can see it will be now nested within the same design that we created before. And now what we can do is we can view the results of the simulation. Again, we are rejecting about 90% of the time, so we are getting the power that we thought we were getting. But in addition to that, we are also getting a few more plots uh, that we can use. So there is a plot on the enrollment prediction that will tell us how the subjects will accrue over time in the median. You can show also the average, but you also have confidence bands um, on the enrollment, and you can also get an events prediction plot. Okay, so this is like the plot that we saw before, which is the plot under the standard survival module that will give you how the events evolve over time, assuming constant enrollment, and now the plot which is based on the simulation and taking into account our site information. So this um, will help us, for example, and say, well, if we are interested in timing, when will the interim look take place, which is after 187 events, I can hit enter, and you can see now that the predicted median is about 
uh, months, and it can happen as early as 15.7 months and as late as 17.8 months. Okay, so it it gives you uh, a buffer around your prediction, and it has also adjusted that prediction not to assume the constant enrollment uh, that uh, is usually assumed um, in these cases. So, um, so this is sort of like an, an enhancement of offered over the standard plot. Now, um, what we can do is we can update um, this prediction and take into account data that comes in. Um, and in this particular case, we have the data that arrived at the interim. So what I can do is I can import uh, two more files. One has the subject level data, which is the, bare, the, the minimum of what we would need for this study. And you can see now, if I add this into my workbook, I have in each country, in each site ID, what was the observed arrival time of a subject, what was the time spent on the study, survival information, and we have treatment information as well as censoring uh, and status, whether we had a dropout or not. And I can also import at the same time, I have the information on site level data, which you may or may not utilize. Uh, we're going to try both uh, approaches um, in the next few minutes. So as you can see here in the site level data, up until the point of the interim, there are some sites in different countries that have opened. For the sites that you have opened, you have uh, the activation time, the observed activation time of the site, and what was the observed enrollment rate. But there are cases where you have sites that have not opened yet at the time of the interim. And for these sites, all you need is the anticipated enrollment rate. All you have is the anticipated enrollment rate. And again, the projections for the, the start and the end of the site initiation period. OK, so this is two pieces of information that we have uh, saved into our uh, workbook. What I can do now is I can click on my um, design, and I can click on the Interim Monitor button, which allows me essentially to play the role of a data monitoring committee. Because at this point, I can analyze the data, and I can see what happens at the interim. First of all, I can analyze the data without playing the role of the Interim Monitoring Committee. I can go in the Analysis tab up here and say, well, I'm going to be running a two-sample log rank test uh, using uh, the, the data that I have just um, created here, so the, the subject level data. And for this, I'm going to be entering my response variable, which is the time on study, my treatment variable, as well as the censoring indicator, okay. I will get some basic analysis, which tells me what the observed hazard ratio is, which is 0.743, based on 187 events. Okay, So this is an analysis of the data that you have at the time of the interim. As I mentioned before, this is something that you can see again in the interim monitoring part. Um, but you will also have a bunch of displays that can help you decide uh, on the continuation or not of the study. So I can enter the interim data at this point. I can do that either by entering summary information, which I have extracted from the analysis, or I can point it directly to the subject level data which would do the analysis for me. If I click on the recalculation button, you can see that this will populate automatically my first row of the interim monitoring dashboard and will essentially tell me that I'm continuing the study. One way to see it is by look at the stop, looking at the stopping boundaries. Let me maximize this window and also show the design. So you can show what the stopping boundaries are. You can see this is the efficacy stopping area. This uh, uh, the, the highlighted point here is the, the test statistic or the boundary that would lead to a rejection of the null hypothesis. And the green point here is my observed test statistic. And as you can see, we do not cross 
the efficacy boundary, we fall into the continuation region, and therefore we would need to continue um, with uh, the recruitment of subjects beyond uh, this interim point. Other things that you can visualize at the, with this display is the conditional powers uh, under different assumptions for the hazard ratio and also under the observed hazard ratio, which is a conditional power of 89%. We can visualize the predictive power, which is the conditional power averaged out over the sampling distribution of uh, the estimated hazard ratio, how much alpha we have spent at the point of the interim, and also we can also we can do some uh, inference, statistical inference, in the form of um, obtaining the repeated confidence intervals for uh, the estimated hazard ratio. So these are as per the Jernison and Turbo approach and the definition of the repeated confidence intervals, where the multiplier of the standard error is not the naive plus minus 1.96, but it is what the uh, uh, estimated um, efficacy boundary is going to be. So as you can see here, the 95% interval is an interval that contains a hazard ratio of 1. So there is no reason for us at this point to reject uh, the null hypothesis. And we also get uh, an estimate of the repeated p-value, again, greater than um, uh, 0.025, again, consistent with the approach to continue the study. One thing that can also be done at this point is to see, well, OK, we had designed the study with an efficacy boundary, so we have no futility mechanism in place. Would, that be, would there be a need to stop the study for futility or not? One of the tools that we offer is the predictive interval plots at this point, where you can click on this and you can point once again to the subject level data that we have entered, match the terms in terms of the treatment, the status, whether you have complete censored or dropout observations, the arrival time of the subjects, as well as the time on the study, the response variable, and use these interim data to estimate the parameters, the hazard um, rates, which can be used uh, in this conditional simulation. So now we're going to be simulating conditional, the remainder of the study, conditional on the results that we obtained at the interim. If I click on the simulate button here, what this will do is it will create, since we selected to simulate 1,000 replications, it will create 1,000 repeated confidence intervals for the completion of the study. And these intervals will be sorted from the smallest hazard ratio to the highest hazard ratio. At the same time, you also have the vertical line for the hazard ratio of 1. And the first thing that you can see is that in terms of estimates, of point estimates, all of the hazard ratios for the simulated data reside below our threshold of 1. In addition to that, we can also see and count how many intervals reside in their entirety below the threshold of 1. And this is reflected in this output here, the percentage of the upper bounds of the intervals, which is less than this threshold that we have set. We can also manually set it to another threshold. And as you can see, we have an 87.8% chance that essentially we're going to be winning at the completion of the study based on the results that we have at the interim. So this is a conditional simulation, conditional on the data that we have seen at the interim. This is something that can also be repeated um, under the alternative hypothesis. Right? If instead of obtain, or estimating the parameters of, from the data, I specify the hazard rate for the treatment as the hazard rate for the control multiplied by oops multiplied by the hazard ratio that I have under the alternative hypothesis 0.714 then this will adjust uh, the hazard rates and if I simulate now the study under the alternative hypothesis I would get something which would give me a bigger probability of success because remember at the analysis time, we observed the hazard ratio of 0.73, roughly, while our 
alternative hypothesis was 0.71. And indeed, that's exactly what we're seeing. You can see that the chance of winning at the end, the probability of success of the study um, under the alternative hypothesis is closer to 93%. Okay, so this is a couple of ways uh, that we can use uh, the, the data, one way at least, that we can use the data that we observed at the interim uh, to update our predictions on the probability of success um, of the study. Another way that this can be used is again in the analysis tab, tab under the predict option. So this will allow us to update our prediction for the events and the enrollment by taking into account what we have already seen up until the interim. And at this point, at this case, we have unblinded data at the interim, but we don't have to do that. We also we can also do this with blinded data. So let me just um, illustrate that by selecting the option to update our prediction based on unblinded data. And this will bring up uh, another input screen which will allow us uh, to once again uh, point to both the subject as well as the, the, the site level uh, data that we have. So this should be coming up any time now. There we go. So I can specify my subject level data by pointing again to the same subject level data that I sourced before. I can get a snapshot of those. So we can just make sure that indeed this is what you're um, reading in. And out of the subject level data, you need to identify again the observed arrival time of a subject, the treatment, if you have unblinded data, the survival information, the response variable, time on study, and the status indicator. At this point, I can just click on next and continue without entering the site information as I just did with the predictive interval plots. But we also have an option if you want to make your predictions a little bit more accurate to include all the data that you have available to you at the time, which is the site-specific information. As soon as I did that, I also have a site ID term here that I need to match. And then I can also point in this bottom panel the my cursor into the site-level data, which I can also visualize and have a snapshot of them. As I mentioned, I need to, to match the terms again, the site ID term, the observed enrollment rate, as well as the enrollment cap. If a site has not been opened, then we don't have an activation time. We have our best guess for the start and the end of the site activation period. If a site has opened, we actually have the activation time. So with this in mind, we can then click on Next. As you will see, this will run the analysis one more, once more. We get what the observed hazard ratio is and the updated hazard rates. And then once again, you can simulate the remaining part of the study by assuming again that the remainder subjects come in according to a Poisson distribution and by simulating a number of uh, trials conditional on your results of the interim. So just to make sure here that uh, we're not going to be waiting for long, I'm going to be simulating one, just 1,000 of these, since we're also going to be saving all the simulated data when we have site information. And as soon as I did this, you can see now that the conditional simulations started to run. Actually, it happens very rapidly. I could afford doing this for 10,000 applications. Uh, but now, and we also now have all the data that were simulated ready to be displayed. So this information can be saved as well into our workbook. And now it resides under the predict sim option. The thing with this op object is that we can now uh, obtain the updated plots for the enrollment, which tells you, which shows you what was uh, the uh, enrollments up to the time of the interim, and then the updated predictions after that. And you also have an idea, again, for the events. Uh, so you have the event prediction plot. Again, how the events accumulated. You can see that we started slow uh, and picked up after that. And then now, how, again, we are predicted to continue the study. Now, 
At this point, you can get also an updated estimate for what the duration of the study would be. Remember that uh, we would require uh, 373 events uh, for 90% power. So if I enter 373 events there, you will see that on average or in median, the study will complete in about 28 and a half months. It can complete as early as 27.5 or 26, 27.6 months and as late as 29.5 months. Okay, so we have also an upgrade, updated prediction for um, when the, um, the study will complete with the help of the conditional simulations and uh, the prediction module. The final thing uh, that I wanted uh, to illustrate here is something, and here I'm just going to go back to our um, presentation, is one of the new features that we have added into the time to event um, in the design of time to event studies. And this is the incorporation of surrogate endpoints uh, in interim looks. The background of this is that um, how agencies treat um, the main endpoint for time to event studies varies. So the FDA, for example, has developed two types of approval processes. They have the accelerated conditional approval and the regular approval. So even though overall survival is the most reliable and the preferred endpoint, regular approvals can also be granted based on established surrogate endpoints, uh, where assessing OS, for example, may give rise to difficulties. So if you have long follow-up in large trials and subsequent uh, cancer therapies potentially confounding survival analysis, that would be one case. So they can um, support secondary endpoints, alternative endpoints, uh, that can be based on tumor assessments like PFS, uh, DFS, disease-free survival, or response rates or symptom assessments. Okay, so this is the background for this. And what we have uh, done in our software is we have um, added through, again, the uh, capabilities of simulation, the uh, option to perform an early stopping decision for futility, because we do not want to um, affect type 1 error, based on an, an endpoint that is different from the long-term endpoint that you would be using in the study. So in this particular case, as we have just seen, um, we have the interim analysis taking place roughly at about 17 months, or when 187 events have taken place. But at the time of 17 months, we would have that 72% of the population will be enrolled, and therefore stopping for futility at the interim analysis will only save about 28% of the resources. So stopping for futility earlier will force us to stop without seeing 50% of unplanned events. So that's why we want to consider a secondary endpoint like PFS or objective response rate. Uh, the additional information that we have for the trial that we have been dealing with from the beginning of this webinar is that each, each patient will have a regular PFS assessment every three months for at least three years. We have the median PFS of three months in the control and four months in the treatment. And we also have information about the correlation between the OS and the PFS endpoint. So let me swing back to our demonstration and go back to our design. And once again, I'm going to be calling up the simulation uh, capabilities uh, for this particular design. And I'm going to bring up the simulation screen. The option that I'm going to be calling upon now is the option to perform a go, no go decision based on a surrogate endpoint. We will get the option to do this either on a survival endpoint like PFS or a binary one. I'm going to be using PFS here. And I'm going to be entering the information that I have for the PFS endpoint, which is three versus four months. Um, a correlation between uh, PFS and OS of 0.75. The three visits that we have a year and the maximum of 12 visits that we have in the span of three years. And we will be stopping for fertility, or we're going to be have make the option to stop for fertility if um, we get um, 
the hazard ratio, which is greater than one. I can actually refresh here my uh, chart, which will show me my old um, sample size and events over time chart as it accumulates um, for the original uh, endpoint. And on top of that, it will also show me the point at which uh, the go no go decision will take place here, which is at roughly 11 months, and uh, and what the um, how the surrogate events are also expected uh, to accumulate. So I can run my simulation now with this setup where we allow a, a, an early stopping based on this uh, secondary endpoint. Again, it runs for 10,000 replications, but it runs quickly because we don't need to save any of the simulation output here. And as soon as this is done, I can save this, the results, on my workbook. And I can then uh, view the, the details uh, of the simulation. So the information that we have here is information about, um, again, what the average sample size, average number of events and dropouts is for each interim look. But we also have information added with respect to this earlier go-no-go no go look. And you, as you can see here, um, we have a 9% chance, 900 out of the 10,000 applications, in which we are stopping early based on this uh, secondary endpoint. The average sample size for the go-no-go no go is about 207. And obviously, we there is a 91% chance that the study will be uh, completing in order to have the future analysis on uh, the primary endpoint. So this is a capability that uh, has recently been added into the time to event um, arsenal uh, within EAST. So I think this was sort of like the, the last feature uh, that I wanted to show you with respect um, to um, the, the demonstration. What I'm have included in the slides are a number of references uh, for the different prediction capabilities for the prediction of events, for the surrogate endpoint interim futility analysis, uh, two and six also deal with that to model the relationship between progression-free survival and overall survival, um, as well as the predictive interval plots uh, that we have seen um, in close to the beginning, where we obtained uh, condition, these repeated confidence intervals uh, conditional on the data that we had at the interim. Um, and uh, Paulman's paper that I mentioned, which is uh, a more recent survey about why we, what the benefits uh, of adaptive designs are going to be. So with this, I will offer you sort of like the, the conclusions that we have here. Um, we have focused, as I mentioned again, on group sequential designs, but in general, adaptive designs have the potential to reduce the sample size without compromising the validity of the study. We can improve our understanding of the probability of failure at an interim analysis and expedite subjects' access to effective therapies. And by doing this with our tool, with EAST, we can streamline the design execution of the adaptive studies, make this an efficient communication tool as you can through the power of simulation, you can obtain these uh, outputs on the fly and discuss it within your clinical team, set more accurate expectations with your leadership, and improve uh, trial predictability for better uh, cross-functional collaboration. And for that, with that, I would like to thank you uh, for attending this. And now I'm going to be passing on uh, the baton back to Alisa. Uh, to field any questions that you might have. Thank you, Pantelis, and thank you for such a wonderful and insightful presentation. Our first okay. question, is there a type one error impact by using surrogate endpoints at the interim? Um, no, I, I, well, um, I think I, I mentioned that during the presentation, but uh, um, what, what we are exploring through the power simulation is an early stop 
or a go-no-go -no -go decision uh, on, f on fertility. So we are only exploring stopping the study early uh, for fertility where we're not going to be having a type 1 error. However, uh, with yeast, um, what, one thing that you can do is you can actually verify this um, on your own as you can do with any sort of adaptive design and with the power of simulation. Because one of the things that can be done is you can simulate under the null hypothesis. So if you simulate under the null hypothesis and then you count in how many cases you will end up rejecting the, uh, the null, the estimated power that we saw in the previous case now becomes essentially an estimate of our type 1 error. And that way would be sort of like a simulation-based approach of seeing that. But again, we also have the theory behind because here we're not considering stopping for um, efficacy, only stopping for futility. Uh, there are some uh, recent uh, developments. Uh, there is a paper, a 2019 paper by Jorgen Serol, where they're using combination testing um, with um, to explore the relationship of a time to event uh, endpoint with a short term endpoint for design adaptations. Uh, and that is a case where they are also exploring the use of, uh, of stopping early for efficacy. So in this case, uh, you would have to use something like a closed testing procedure combination test to uh, ensure that your type one error is being maintained. In our case, we don't have that because we are only considering stopping for efficacy, for futility, sorry. Thank you, Pantelis. Um, we have another question here. Why use prediction plots and not just report conditional power? Uh, right. So the, pre uh, the prediction interval plots. Right. So let me go back here where we had some of these plots. So in the in this interim monitoring that we run, obviously, yes, I, I see the point. So uh, we got after the interim data became available that the conditional power is 89%. Okay, so this gives you essentially the chance of success in the remainder part of the study. Uh, while with the prediction interval plots, we were also able to get um, an 87.8%, close to that uh, 89% uh, probability of winning. The, the added value, however, of the prediction interval plots is that um, you, you're getting predictions of the confidence intervals for the parameter of interest at the final data analysis if the trial continues to end. Uh, so we have information about effect size, which are invariant to the study design and provide flexibility in the decision-making process. So we don't only have sort of like a threshold of whether we stop or not, but we're also getting uh, estimates for this um, estimate of the uh, estimates for the effect size at that point. Thank you, Pantelis. This is a nice lead into another question that we have here. What is the uh, what is the meaning? of the red and blue in the predicted interval plot? Um, well, again, so this is, it, it's sort of like, uh, I, I, there, there's no particular uh, meaning. So basically, what, whenever you have uh, results that are on the tail end, either on the low end or on the high end, you have sparser um, instances of conditionally of, of, of simulated data while here you have many more of the observations or many more of the simulated data have been actually around this uh, observed hazard ratio so it's sort of like a heat map of how many you ended up seeing closer to that uh, area thank you Pantelis all right is there anything else that you'd like to add Pantelis um, no so I just just like to repeat that um, in what you're going to be receiving also in terms of the, the log of what you saw today. Um, there's going to be sort of like a step-by-step -step essentially replication of the demonstration that I did uh, in East, uh, as well as uh, a module by module description initially of the modules that we covered today, um, which are the, the base, sequential, survival, and predict, as well as the remaining modules uh, in East in um, as well as mentioning what are the, the new features uh, that we have added uh, in version 6.5. And uh, as always, uh, I would welcome any questions offline. You have my contact uh, information. 
uh, and I'll be more than happy uh, to entertain them. Thank you, Pantelis, and thank you everyone for attending today's webinar on designing event-based studies to reduce sample size and increase predictability. On behalf of CITEL, thank you for joining us today and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.